uh, Hosea. We are looking at uh, this. The uh, uh, Actually, I've changed the outline. I'll show you next week, as God allows. Um, the commentary that I'm using kind of waits till it gets to it and says, now this is a different section, so now nah, I have to go back. But um, here's where we've been. The uh, Part one, the prophet, the man and the message, <clears throat> and the God based the message on uh, what he was having him go through in his life. Your life, uh, as God leads, is part of your life message. Um, in a lot of ways, your life becomes the frame of the portrait of your life. Um, a good frame doesn't steal attention away from the picture but by contrast or by uh, some other way it, it puts it forth it it uh, completes the picture and um, you uh, pay attention to how God is leading in your life what trials what problems and um, recognize that uh, <clears throat> these things are organized by God that the Satan can't give you trials unless God okays it. Uh, reference uh, the book of Job. And while it's spelled out for us there, it was not spelled out for Job, uh, evidently until later. I, I think he wrote the book to uh, recount his uh, the lessons learned. But uh, James chapter 1 tells us we should start counting it joy when we go have another trial, another test, another problem. Because within that, you will find that um, God will give you the strength, God will give you the victory if you're trusting him. Now you start running off to the world for explanations of your problem and answers to your problems. You get what they give, that's all I can say. Uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes actually based on uh, biblical truth, but very often not. <clears throat> uh, but um, the Apostle Paul uh, took that shameful time in his life when he was actually persecuting the church and held it up uh, very often in the book of Acts, uh, giving the testimony of what he used to be, not to glory in it, but to, to reveal the shame of it and to say that God could save even somebody like me. Um, so, and, and 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says that God will comfort us in all of our trials, and the, the lessons learned, we can sh comfort others with the same comfort we've received. So part of the deal of going through trials as Hosea had to go through. Part of that deal is learning how to see God's path through it, uh, through the trial, to the end. And then when you find someone who's going through that, you can say with, with all truth, I know what you're going through. <laughs> People like to say that when they have no idea what they're going through. But you can say, I know what you're going through. And um, here's how God worked in my life. And this is a very powerful counseling. I was at a, uh, a couple had visited our church years ago and went to visit them. And uh, she, I could tell, was kind of standoffish and so on. It ends up that early in her life, uh, before she met her husband, uh, a good Christian man, she, she got pregnant. Well, the parents were attending a, uh, basically a liberal Methodist church. Liberal, I mean uh, unbelieving, uh, not, not trusting the word of God, uh, just do-goodism and that type of thing. But in that, they were sort of, and especially the mother was um, lifted up and was a, uh, an exalted person in that church. 
And so she told her daughter that she had to get an abortion and we hush this up. Or if she chose to keep the baby, then they were going to kick her out, have nothing to do with her. She'd be on her own forever. So she said to me, so I didn't have a choice. And I said, well, actually, you did have a choice. You chose the easier one. Um, she said, yes. And she recognized that she did feel the guilt in that, although at that age she had no confidence in, in her ability to handle it on her own. But with the abortion, there was a botched thing and... So after that, she couldn't have any children at all. And so the summation of her experience was the church, she didn't want, the mother didn't want her to look bad at the church for the mother's sake. And uh, so she lost the ability to have children. And I said, you understand that unbelieving, self-promoting, law-keeping religion made that decision and what you believe now is salvation by grace and the love of God. I said, but you are in a particularly important place because you could advise young girls who are in the situation you were in to say, let me just tell you how, uh, how you may trust God when I didn't. And what happened is that I could never have any more children, even when I had a, a loving husband who wanted to take care of me. Um, I said, you could say to them, I know what you're going through. I've been there. And I said, so few people would ever be able to say that. So consider that. And uh, God chose the man and put him through a terrible thing where his wife ran off and uh, lived in, a, in, in adultery and lived as a, as a prostitute. Um, what a shame and what a reproach. And then God told him to love her. And he actually bought her back as a slave at a discount price. She must not have been worth much. And then she became, you know, somebody that was well worth uh, his love as she responded to his love. And this was the picture of God looking at Israel. Uh, in this, the, the theme we've chosen here is the love for Israel, because in the midst of this, he's putting a stop to the, to the violence, stop to the, uh, the destruction that their unbelief was accomplishing. He was, he was cutting out the cancer of their society. And in all of that, <clears throat> he's going to rescue those that were in good shape. Now, it's particularly the northern kingdom rather than Judah, the southern kingdom, that is, it, this is the Assyrian captivity where uh, the south was going to be taken by the Babylonian captivity later. What we have looked at then is the introduction, one to th chapters 1 to 3, and then the completed messages. Under that, now my A and B is going to be chapters uh, 4 through 10. And then 11 to 14 will be a second thing. Um, so, uh, because the, the first part of this, 4 through 10, emphasizes the deserving judgment, and uh, 11 to 14 emphasizes his love. So um, I'll change that outline uh, if you've been keeping it. Throw all that away. I'll give you a new outline this next time. All right, so we've looked at God's introduction to Hosea's message, then God's destruction and ruin upon Israel and Judah. Uh, he sees it coming. God's descriptions uh, calls them various uh, titles, various names. And then God's justice is released upon them. This is where... What they have done has been collected in the cup, and uh, uh, that, that sin is collected, and then it's poured out on them in judgment. This is the eye for an eye, the tooth for a tooth thing. 
This is where what the person did to somebody else comes back on them. And God collects the sin in a cup, pours it out on them. Uh, I, I believe that that's what Christ was referring to when he said, may this cup pass from me. Uh, he was a brave person. He had already said that I'm, I'm going there and I'm going to suffer and die and be raised again. So I don't think the prayer in the garden was about saving his life. Um, he recognized that he was restricted, he was straightened and narrowed um, while he was in this, in this life. And so once he got through death and resurrection, he would be back to uh, independent use of his godly powers. But what was the cup? Well, that was all the filth of every person that's ever lived and ever will live the filth of your sin, the filth of your crimes, the filth of mine, and all collected in some giant cup and all poured out on him at the cross. That would shake even a member of the triune God to experience sin, which is the very opposite of who God is. Uh, anyway, I'm getting off the track. But uh, we see the justice released and then God's rebuke. We come now to point F, God's justice. We see, one, the losses that Israel suffered. This was including the loss of fruit as idols were multiplied to the more they made uh, altars to the false idols, false gods. Uh, they, uh, their harvest would suffer. The loss of their expensive altars. And he says, you've taken the gold and silver that you've earned by the fruit that I've given you, the harvest I've given you, and made these things, and I'm going to tear them down, and they're going to have rats running around where they are now. See. We come now to the loss of their king, and this is Hosea 10.3. For, for now they shall say, we have no king, because we feared not the Lord, not Jehovah. What then should a king do to us? <clears throat> um, if we had had a godly king, what would he have done to us? But because we feared not the Lord, God is taking away our king. So he pictures them in captivity, bewailing the loss of their independence. Now they will have no king uh, of their people, and a pagan king, a benighted mind of a king will rule over them. Second Kings 17, 6 and 7. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria. Samaria was the capital city of uh, the northern kingdom and carried Israel away, the northern kingdom, away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the city of the Medes. <clears throat> they broke them up into pieces and put them here, there. So they were, they were always a little minority among uh, another group of people, but they couldn't connect with each other and encourage each other. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt and had feared other gods. <coughs> they were under the other gods in Egypt, Egypt had a multitude of gods. Everything from the Pharaoh down to the Nile, and then down to the fly. And uh, yes, I'm the god of flies. Oh, well, good for you. Um, but they see their guilt in not fearing Jehovah, and they ask themselves if we had a godly king, what would he have done to us in our land? Well, the answer is we would have had severe punishment or even death because we were not following the truth. And a good king would, would have enforced that. In fact, God's law was the law of the land. It was the constitution of their nation. Delivered them to them from God, from Mount Sinai. The next point is that the, the loss of their covenant with Jehovah. God had made a promise 
to them, if you, then I, and they said, yes, we will obey your law. This is acceptable to us. We hear, we understand. We're going to accept your challenge of a perfect society, of a perfect human life. In verse 4, they have spoken words, swearing falsely in making a covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. Hemlock is a poison, a well-known poison. They went back on their vows of their covenant with God. We've looked at that earlier. <clears throat> in consequence, judgment spontaneously appeared around them. The word translated hemlock. I was kind of surprised that it would be that well known in this time, in this place. But it's the general word for gall, something that you taste and it's so bitter, of venom, poison, uh, anything that's bitter, uh, bite and bitter come from the same root in English. And uh, that's because the things bite you, uh, bite your tongue if it's you know, extremely bitter, and, uh, and also can bite your, uh, your health. Uh, bitter book of uh, Revelation has a uh, kind of a meteorite that lands and poisons the water, and it's called wormwood. <clears throat> and um, the people that drink it, their, their body becomes bitter. And then just generally poisonous. So uh, um, he says, and th this appears in the furrow of the field. Um, the uh, poison springs up. Instead of good harvest, poison springs up all around them. We move on then to number two, the grievous cost of idolatry. In the United States of America, we have turned to idols. Uh, there is a very concentrated emphasis to turn away from the true and living God. Uh, and they do that, did that first by turning away from the Bible, by just, uh, you know, the, the cry that we're hearing now, follow the science, follow the science. But they don't mean that. What they mean is our science. Uh, what we want you to understand. Uh, I'm reading a number of articles by scientists, by medical people, who disagree with uh, the, the official science. And, uh, and now, after COVID is moving away, uh, we're, we're hearing people coming out and saying, well, yeah, we were pressured uh, to keep this, uh, this tone. So... Uh, it was a political science uh, that was emphasized. Not to say it was all wrong. I'm just saying that uh, nobody, you know, science is always a theory and it's tested and then it's ad adjusted. This wasn't. So they've removed the Bible. And now, because like the next generation, then why should we believe? The Bible teaches us to believe in God, to follow God. And if you you get rid of the word of God then what do you have you know you have a book and you can believe it or not like it or not doesn't matter uh, once uh, once they lose the word of God then the very reason for marriage goes away God's the one who invented that um, once they uh, you know, they demanded the laws, okay, quick divorce. Then it began to attack what the Bible says. <clears throat> then, um, with the, uh, the gay marriage concept, um, it frankly opened it up. You could marry anyone, anything, uh, multiple of, of people. Uh, there were no rules about marriage. Marriage actually stops existing when it means everything. If you, if you have something that means everything, it means nothing. Uh, so <clears throat> this is what's going on with us. We are not Israel. And we are not, America, though blessed and privileged, is not God's nation. 
and never has been historically. The point of my saying that is that uh, the very fact that it happened to Israel doesn't mean it happened, but God is the same and the sin is the same. Dare we suppose that there will not be similar consequences? Let's read 5 to 8 together. <clears throat> the inhabitants of Samaria, capital of the northern kingdom, shall fear because of the calves of Beth Haven. These were the uh, replacement of Jehovah worship that they had um, set up. One in the north and one in the south. And they'll mourn, <coughs> fear, because the people thereof shall mourn over it. And the priest thereof, and the King James margin here says, uh, it's this word which translated would mean the priest thereof, but maybe that's a, a place name that rejoice on it for the glory thereof because it is departed from it the glory is departed uh, what's the word Ebenezer Ichabod. Je Ichabod Ichabod the glory has departed it shall be also carried unto Assyria Israel will be for a present to King Jareb Ephraim shall receive shame Israel shall be ashamed of her own counsel Ephraim was the dominant tribe of the north. <clears throat> Israel, the name of the whole northern kingdom, shall be ashamed of its own of his own counsel. We advised this, and now it's left us like this. As for Samaria, her king is cut off as the foam upon the water, the face of the water. Uh, if you see foaming waves, uh, as the wind blows, the foam is whipped off. And so the king is cut off. The high places also of Avon, Beth Avon, house of shame, Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. And so the, these false places will be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Now you might remember hearing that phrase. Uh, this is uh, in uh, the book of Luke. Christ actually quotes this as part of what's happening in the tribulation period. And then early in the book of the Revelation, um, it mentions that they will call on the mountains to fall down and cover them uh, from the fear of God. So fear dominates the people for the loss of their golden calves but we, we prayed sincerely to them. We, thought, we, we called them Jehovah. We, we weren't trying to turn away from God. We were saying, this is our God. See? And God says, that's not me. Therefore, you were worshiping a pagan altar, pagan idol. Loss of the golden calves. The priests mourn the loss of the idol's glory. When faced with their rebellion to Jehovah God, they became ashamed of their frivolous religious attitudes. They think of it as they are cruelly marched into the various lands by Assyria. Their glorious altars are broken, the wealth stolen. These altars are left desolate with the growth of thorns and thistle, left barren. Again then, number three, the testimony of God himself against Israel. Verses 9 through 11 First of all, notice in uh, verse 9, God remembers when they stood strong for morality. God brings up something we've brought out before. The tribe of Benjamin was nearly wiped out because of a horrible, uh, uh, false, you know, just a horrible sexual abuse. And, uh, and then Benjamin stood up for him. You are not going to touch these people because uh, the army of Israel came and said, deliver them to us unto death. And they said, no, you try to take them. Well, they did and nearly wiped out, uh, down to what, 600 men, I think we, we read. So he reminds them of this, <clears throat> Hosea 10, 9. O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. That's the, the key word, the city. It goes back to where that happened. There they stood, you stood bravely, you stood valiantly. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. 
So you proved true when you saw the ghastliness of their sin. And then to find that they were standing up for them, we'll do what we want here, see. And they said, not in Israel. So when the sin of Benjamin and the rest of the tribe's defense of it came to Israel's ears, Israel stood strong against the children of iniquity. Since then, however, they became such children. They became the sinners, and they said, uh, you don't tell us what to do. We'll tell you what we're going to do. Secondly, verse 10, God chastens Israel as they once did Benjamin. It is my desire that I should chastise them and the people shall be gathered against them when they shall bind themselves in, into two furrows. And that whole phrase could be translated when I shall bind them for their two transgressions or their two habitations. And the, the focus on two seems to indicate the two golden calves that uh, uh, they had used to replace Jehovah worship. So as the tribe of Benjamin was confident in their fighting abilities, and they had great fighting abilities, uh, and resisted the entire army uh, for two days, but on the third day, they uh, were led into a deception. So uh, Benjamin defended evil in their midst. God desires to chastise Israel for defending their two golden calves. The third point here is that God removes Israel from incursions into Judah. Verse 11, And Ephraim is as an heifer that is taught, and loveth to tread out the corn, but I passed over her, I passed upon her fair neck, uh, uh, and uh, the beauty of her neck, I will make Ephraim to ride, Judah shall plow, and Jacob shall break his clods. Now, the clods are not just dumb people that live around, but the clods are the clumps of dirt and the plowing. Now, what's, what's being said here? Well, Ephraim, the northern kingdom, was like a young cow that trespassed into others' fields to trample and eat the grain. So the runaway uh, young heifer can uh, go into your uh, wheat field and uh, trample it down, and that breaks the wheat loose from the, from the stalk, and then it spends the time grazing on your field. So God passes the yoke of restraint and guidance over her neck, and even now looking at her, you know, a beautiful neck, a neck that, um, that I have loved and, and tried to keep free. But he was going to yoke them in. So make Ephraim ride, kind of difficult to understand, but probably takes the meaning of cause her to draw the plow. Um, the words allow that meaning. This will be in someone else's field, not her own. She cannot benefit in the work. She will not be able to graze. However, as Adam Clark says, Judah and Jacob shall plow for themselves, meaning that Judah should not now plow for Israel. Uh, Israel would come in and take their harvest from time to time, <clears throat> but, uh, but Judah will plow for himself, while Jacob, the northern kingdom, plows, breaking the clods of earth in a foreign field. So you will work in the field, but not your own. You will work in a field and not gather it for yourself, uh, while Judah will be left alone to, uh, to work and plow. All right, let's move on then to point number four. God's prophet calls upon them to repent. Where, where we have been listening to the prophet give us God's words, now we, we listen to the prophet who says, you hear what's, what's happening here. So pay attention. This is uh, chapter 10, verses 12 to 15. Listen to these words. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is t this is the hardened earth that the seed of, of the truth was not sinking into that ground. You need to break it up. You need to have your heart um, plowed under so that you can receive the word of God. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. 
He says things could be different, should be different. You should be repenting. You have plowed wickedness, you have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way, in the multitude of thy mighty men. We're powerful enough to do what we want. Verse 14, Therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people, <clears throat> and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled. This is broken into and everything worth anything taken. As Shalman spoiled Beth Arbel in the day of battle, the mother was dashed in pieces upon her children. Horrible, horrible destruction. So shall Bethel do unto you because of your great wickedness, the evil of your evil, is what it literally says. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. So sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. So what is he saying here? Well, if you're unhappy with the way things are now, change what you're sowing. You sow sin and you reap the, uh, um, the consequences. Each sin brings its own consequence. Why God said, don't do it. Play in the street, you get hit by a car. They could rejoice to reap what they sow if they follow God's way. Here the prophet is pointing out obedience equals following God's perfect pattern for human life. We've talked about this idea, the two ways of life. Notice uh, Psalm 1-6. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. God has seen it. He has, he has given you that path. He knows it. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. Two different ways of living. Two different ways of basing your life upon something. Proverbs 12-28. In the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death. When he says, thou didst trust in thy way, in the light of their own wisdom, their own way, they performed foolishly. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. And this would, of course, be the counsel of God. Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. This is picturing the foolishness that man can get into when they have stopped um, acknowledging God, not giving glory to him, not uh, thanking him, not giving thanks. Then uh, it messes with their mind. They don't see things the way it really is. And so... Uh, you know, like, like bad politics, we get our way, they say, and then our way leads to the devastation of the country. Um, somehow they think that's going to be better, but um, it is not. We'll stop there and uh, come back to understand about uh, Shalman and uh, Beth Arbel. We have to do a little research to get into that. So we'll share that with you next time as God allows. Comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, let's stand together. We'll be dismissed with prayer. Our Father, thank you for showing us the caution that we ought to have when we, as a nation, turn away from thee. Father, we know that you will be with us to the degree um, that you choose. We will be protected, <clears throat> but we may suffer greatly at the loss of our uh, blessings, the loss of America's um, authority, the loss of uh, America's uh, prosperity. We ask that you might so work that we will trust in thee for our sake and for our family and be sure never to compromise just for the sake of getting along. We ask that you might help us then to be people who stand for righteousness, come what may, if we have to stand as martyrs 
we will do that for what is uh, after our death will be much better than what we would have here. So keep us strong. Keep us of good courage. Help us to stand for what is right. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.